Okay, we are continuing our morning plenaries. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Lewis Friedman, co-founder of the Planetary Society. He will be presenting a political history of the human mission to Mars. Um, thank you, Dr. Friedman. Pleasure to be here. Um, Carol ended her talk with uh, channeling Carl Sagan. I'm going to uh, start mine with uh, a little story from Carl Sagan that he told us uh, actually at the very beginning of the Planetary Society. He was describing being invited to the White House um, by Jimmy Carter. Now, I know most of the people in the audience wouldn't even recognize that name, uh, <laughs> but he was a president of the United States back in the day. And um, uh, Carter was, uh, uh, what was his daughter's name? Amy. Uh, uh, wanted Sagan to t talk about the interesting things that, uh, that is basically tutoring, or not tutoring, but meant uh, giving uh, some background, a sort of a private uh, uh, background on, on Cosmos, and which was very popular at the time. And uh, Carl, of course, uh, intrigued the whole family with uh, uh, the stories of space exploration. And at the end of uh, the evening, uh, Carter said to him, uh, this is absolutely terrific. We need to be doing more of this. You need to write more books. And uh, Carl said uh, to President Carter, no, you just need to write your name on a slip of paper. And, well, turns out Jimmy Carter was right. The president doesn't really make uh, uh, doesn't make it happen. It happens in a much more complex process, and presidents have tried to write their names on slips of paper uh, to uh, to make Mars exploration happen. And I got intrigued with this uh, about a year and a half ago when uh, the change of administration killed the program that was called the Journey to Mars in favor of a new program that has now become known as the Lunar Gateway, another changeover, uh, which we've had several of in the past administrations, and I've decided to look more deeply at this whole history of how a presidential initiative, uh, which we had several of them now, uh, had gotten treated and when it actually became a, something more serious than just a speech. So I, uh, I got into the subject. How do I make this go forward? Or just an arrow, probably. That one. And so I did a paper uh, on it. And these are the references to the paper. And the only reason I'm showing you this is because I wanted to be sure that you understood. I actually looked into the subject uh, deeply. And I have a written paper on it uh, uh, as well, which I think is going to make its way I don't know if it'll make its way into a, a journal publication, but it's going to make its way into my next book, I think. Um, but this is a summary of uh, presidential action on human Samar, starting with President Kennedy, who, of course, set us uh, out for the moon, but never mentioned Mars. Uh, and then we had uh, uh, that followed on. Uh, the next effort was made by President Nixon, uh, and in Nixon's case, specifically rejected the Mars goal. Uh, and it was proposed uh, at a very high level by NASA to push the, uh, uh, to make a recommendation, in fact, more than at NASA, at the vice presidential level, uh, equivalent to the Space Council level, that there should be a Mars goal. And there was three levels of funding associated with that. And uh, the Nixon, and Nixon basically said, no, we'll do the lowest level. And then as soon as th that was called the space shuttle, and then as soon as that uh, decision was implemented, he then cut that funding and, and gave up the reusability aspect of most of the space shuttle. So, uh, so that was the, uh, basically the first rejection of a Mars goal. Then it really didn't get considered again. Uh, there was a little bit of effort made in the Carter administration to uh, adopt a, a, space, uh, a space goal, but uh, Carter rejected any high challenge engineering goal uh, at the time. There was uh, um, political conditions were certainly against it, and of course. Uh, and then we had the, uh, the Reagan administration and the space station decision. But that also didn't mention Mars at all. 
and it was just focused on the space station, and it was coupled with another big space initiative, a little bit analogous to what's going on now, and that was the Strategic Defense Initiative. Star Wars is, is became popularly known and basically involves space weapons testing. Well, it turned out that actually set the stage for the only other serious consideration of uh, Mars goal specifically. Namely, that Reagan and Gorbachev, in the, as the Soviet Union was coming apart, we didn't know it at the time, of course, but um, uh, Gorbachev was introducing vast economic and political reforms in the Soviet Union, and Reagan and Gorbachev had a series of summits at which it was specifically proposed by Gorbachev to do a joint human mission to Mars. Reagan was intrigued. He was very positive about that idea. But it turned out that the reasons for both of them almost making a summit agreement on this was coupled into that strategic defense initiative. In the case of the Soviets, they were looking for a something that was an alternative to space weapons testing. In the case of the Americans, they were looking for something that uh, was benign, that they could show their peaceful intent while they were doing the space uh, space weapons testing. And in fact, at Reykjavik in the summit, uh, or in, I'm sorry, in the summit after Reykjavik in Washington, um, Gorbachev came with a paper proposing a joint uh, human Mars mission. Um, and Reagan, as I say, was positive about the subject. There was no, NASA wasn't involved in this at all. All of the debate was taking it into uh, uh, in the context of the Strategic Defense Initiative and by the Defense Department and the people worried about that subject. And um, basically, Gore, uh, Reagan did finally, con I mean, Gorbachev finally did concede, okay, you can have SDI, you can have ground testing, but you have to give up space testing. We're not gonna, you know, the, and Reagan said, no, we have to have space testing. and. I characterize this now as the Soviets being unduly alarmed about the danger of SDI and the Americans being duly impressed about the benefits of it. Uh, both were wrong, as it, I think it's, it's turned out, but they couldn't come to an agreement and the human to Mars thing was put on the side. That was actually a very intense time for us at the Planetary Society. We took out a full page advertisement in the Washington Post with a Mars declaration that was signed not just by tens and almost 100,000 people, but also by many distinguished uh, leaders in, in fields, cabinet officials, uh, members of Congress, uh, ec every ex-administrator, I mean, every administrator of NASA except the one that was then serving uh, and many other uh, distinguished people trying to get that onto the uh, from the summit agenda into action, but it didn't happen. And that was the last time that a human Mars mission actually made it up to the political level. It then got proposed in, in other administrations, and in fact, the several administrations, um, but it was always a space initiative and it never had any geopolitical or political context whatsoever. Uh, Bush 41 proposed it, but never funded it and uh, nothing ever happened with it. That was the Space Exploration Initiative, SEI, sort of a parallel to the SDI idea. Um, the, the Clinton administration had, um, whereas Al Gore, the vice president uh, under Clinton, actually did push a joint Soviet uh, and then Russian um, uh, American Mars mission idea when he was running for president and came into uh, uh, sort of pushing uh, into office pushing that idea Clinton was never interested in it and wouldn't have been interested in space at all except it was a very propitious time uh, for the space station because uh, he wanted he was given the uh, or NASA was given the task of engaging the Russian aerospace industry having to get them some money to do something. Space Station had been proposed by Reagan eight years earlier but wasn't going anywhere. Clinton actually uh, ended up funding it and getting it supported because it fit the uh, Russian engagement obje uh, objective and that's how the Space Station got built but with no Mars objective whatsoever. 
Then uh, Bush 43 came in and there was another mention of Mars. It was a, uh, going back to the moon and on to Mars and that became a, a program which resulted in Constellation which was then scaled down to be a moon only program. Mars was forgotten and then that program stretched out to the point where it was uh, finally decided in 2009 that it was unsustainable. Uh, that was the recommendation of the commission ended by, uh, led by uh, Norm Augustine. And so when the incoming Obama administration came in, they basically were faced with this unsustainable program. They ended up canceling it, a decision that can be debated, uh, and starting out in a different direction, basically with the conclusion, by the way, a conclusion that uh, uh, I had taught to me several years earlier by Mike Griffin on a study that the Planetary Society was doing, but I never forgot it, but Mike apparently did, and that was that the U.S. can't afford to build both a lander and a transportation system at the same time, a planetary lander transportation system at the same time. And that's what we were trying to do with Constellation. That's why it was unsustainable. Uh, so when the Obama administration came in, they took uh, uh, that advice to heart and they gave up on the idea of they were going to delay the transportation system and work on, uh, on the uh, space commercial development of transportation and, uh, and have a longer range program, which they then became known as the journey to Mars. However, the Congress did put the transportation system back in and now we have the SLS and the, uh, uh, the journey to Mars became bogged down with the immediate requirements, the first steps out into the interplanetary space. First step was to be an asteroid redirect mission. Uh, that brought up a lot of opposition. People misunderstanding it thought it had something to do with asteroids which was not the case, it was having to do with getting astronauts out beyond Earth orbit. And, uh, but that was killed then, of course, when the Trump administration came in. And so now we have basically another program which says it has a Mars goal, but I'm very skeptical of that, and has a lunar goal, and we'll see how that works out. So that's basically the history of, uh, of this uh, whole program. As I say, it only happened once. that. Uh, that uh, the Mars program got significant. And I put this chart up with that big gap uh, purposely because I want to emphasize that there's only been two positive human spaceflight program decisions in all of uh, the space age history. One was the Kennedy decision to go to the moon and the other was the Clinton decision to build the space station. Neither of those decisions had anything to do with their interest in the space program. In fact, both of those presidents were almost negative about the space program. They didn't, uh, they certainly weren't interested in space exploration. The Kennedy program was driven by the fact that we had to beat the Russians to the moon. The Clinton program was, uh, the Clinton support was built, uh, rested on the fact that we had to engage the Russians uh, 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 so that their aerospace industry didn't get uh, diverted into funding uh, or uh, being used by nations that were more threatening to the United States. So that's, that's the only two positive decisions that have ever been made, and they entirely rest on a geopolitical rationale, not on any space program rationale. So all the arguments that says it's sensible to do uh, human exploration or to, to have a human Mars mission for some other reasons have just never gotten anywhere politically. So what my conclusion is is that it, we, that will continue to be the case. The geopolitical rationale is needed for human, uh, human Mars exploration. I was a great proponent of humans to Mars. This was actually something also taught to me by Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray, uh, that basically they felt and uh, we came to realize that Mars exploration, the robotic missions, as wonderful as they are, in some sense they're dead-ended if there's no humans ever going to go there. So we supported the long-range view of humans going to Mars. Uh, as those of you who saw my, read my book last year, I'm now beginning to question that a little more because 
What we didn't take into account is the tremendous evolving technology that's going on, and you're going to have a panel on that subject, uh, I guess, next, uh, virtual reality. Uh, and uh, so much is, is being done with robotic and uh, technology uh, in so many ways that maybe uh, human exploration will not serve any, will, or will be done without humans having to go there. But right now, uh, we still try to have humans' missions to Mars. We, is there a geopolitical rationale? I don't see any right now at all. Uh, that will change, maybe, uh, when we have an administration now that uh, if you were looking for a geopolitical rationale, uh, perhaps international cooperation will come back into, uh, into vogue. Uh, right now, it, it, there'll be a counter-reaction, excuse me, there'll be a counter-reaction to the current anti-international uh, cooperation uh, feelings that are that are dominating government right now and when that comes into play perhaps nations will be looking for things that they can do together to get on projects that are both benign and international uh, that would uh, create the support that's a very small window but it's a window that I think gives people a sense of optimism that we at least keep trying to have the uh, set the stage for uh, human exploration I do feel we're somewhat in a race of uh, humans versus robots, space race, the modern space race, in which the robot technology may be overtaking not the capabilities of humans. That, that, that's another whole subject beyond my ken to, to get into, but the, the, taking over the psychology of young people being satisfied with virtual exploration uh, in, in many ways right now, and we're, we see that in astronomy, we see that in uh, lots of other uh, fields, and of course we see that with you know, people on their phones all day with virtually presence in social media. So I think that the, perhaps uh, the future of human exploration might be done without humans there, but so far we're s still in a space race, and I'm human, I'm still rooting for the humans, so uh, I, sorry, I'm a chauvinist in that regard. Um, and I guess at that, I'll give back some of the time to, to catch up on the program. Okay, a couple of questions right here in the front row. I challenge, too, the inherent assumptions you have there, one of which, as we see more evidence of, is that I need a government program to go to Mars. And the second one that I challenge is that an international program makes it more affordable. It makes them more difficult to kill, like the space station, but I'd say it drives up the cost. So, your, your thoughts. I didn't quite hear it, but I think I did. First one was, do we really need a government program to go to Mars? And we heard, of course, about SpaceX. Um, I think so for a while. Uh, the whole history of commercial space development has been long on, on, on plans and short on performance. We don't even have commercial space flight suborbital yet. Orbital is a long way off. Uh, with all due respect to the 2022 and 2024 dates we heard earlier, they're reminiscent of the early uh, rocket dates we heard. So I think it's a long way off. Furthermore, who's going to pay for those missions? Elon has been extraordinarily successful, and, and, and I admire him greatly. I told him, you know, he's on the board of the Planetary Society, and I kept telling him, I'm not going to argue with him anymore. He's, he's always right. But <laughs> he, uh, but it, on the other hand, uh, uh, he's, been, he's been extraordinarily successful. He's not, he hasn't had to pay for the, these developments and things like that. And will, uh, who will pay for those uh, landing missions on Mars. That's a, we're a long way off from that, and I see the government as the only customer for that. I don't see a lot of private development into that. If I was a private investor, I'd be investing in virtual technology for exploring Mars, not in life support systems to sustain people there. So I'm very skeptical on that whole private development's going to do it all and we can get the government out of the way. Uh, on the second question of the international aspect, again, I, I just used the space station as the example. I think the space station, even without a great purpose, is an enormous success. 
Nobody knows what the space station does, but it's been an extraordinary success <laughs> at bringing, I'm talking not the people in this room, I'm talking, I'm talking to people who are across the street over in the, in the shopping malls. Nobody knows what the space station does, but it's an extraordinary success for the nations it's brought together. I think it deserves a Nobel Peace Prize for the way it's brought so many nations together in such a high challenge engineering activity that has so many spin-offs of, 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 great, of great value uh, in a way. Imagine what an international mission that could do something uh, that would have a greater purpose on that assignment. So, um, and I don't see any national reason that anybody is doing anything along those lines. We can't even uh, get the uh, political momentum for a national reason to build a rocket, let alone, you know, something on, as grand as that. So that's my skepticism on it. But I'm just, I could be wrong. Uh, I've been noticing that uh, China, uh, China's space program has been developing pretty rapidly. Can you comment on their potential or lack of potential as a rival to try to uh, goose the American space program? Yeah, I think China is definitely a relevant factor, um, and um, they will have enormous success as they are sure, certainly building up a great capability. But the thing to remember is they will also have some failures, and they will also have some economic issues. China is fantastic, but it's not magic. And they, the things that, they, that the U.S. and Soviet Union and now Russia have coped with as their programs achieved their initial goals and then had to deal with the economic justification for why do we have a human spaceflight program and why do we spend money on these things and, and, and having a setback uh, with an accident or something like that along the way. Those things will likely happen. And then how will China react to that? And how will China engage with other countries in that regard? So it's all, I, I think it's all relevant, but I don't think it's all, it, it's not magic. It's not going to happen. If China does make it to the moon, and they will eventually, uh, American reaction will be, should be, you know, well, we did that. Well, welcome to the club. And now let's see what we can do together to go further. But whether that will be the conditions in a long time from now to, to do that, as I say, uh, I have, there are other political forces at that at stage that will dominate that, and they won't be the space program forces. There'll be other geopolitical forces that will dominate that. <laughs>